queer people have been invisible for a long time, um, and some of it has to do with bigotry. Um, it's very easy for us to be invisible, unlike people of color. Um, you, I mean, some people will say, oh, how can anyone miss I'm queer? But quite honestly, um, lots of us can pass. No one would know. And so because we have put ourselves in a position to be invisible, I think it's time for us to step up and be out, um, to be out for our students who are um, LGBTQ so that they know that yes, you know, there is life, you can, you can get through this. Many of us are involved politically in our local communities and nationally with different groups about um, LGBT rights. And um, I think it's very important for our writing, for our literacy, for our voices. We often get accused of um, not having a culture so why do we have to fight for our rights? And actually, we do have a culture. The Queer Caucus really serves both emerging scholars as well as uh, those who are more established. Uh, for emerging scholars, I think it offers them the opportunity to meet uh, other young scholars from other campuses from across the nation who otherwise they may not have the chance to meet. Uh, I think for more established faculty, they actually get to meet the younger uh, scholars who are keeping things fresh and are doing maybe some cutting edge work. One of the things that we are putting together this year, and a lot of it's going to happen online because it'll be easier for people, is, is a mentoring system. Um, because many people don't have a queer faculty member to mentor them. Um, into the profession. You know, they'll have, uh, you know, dissertation advisors, etc., but there's so much more that goes on that people who are not queer wouldn't really understand. And so we're going to match people up with mentors, you know, from different institutions. And I think that alone is a really good reason for grad students to join. We're also kind of working on queer methodologies. And actually, it's the grad students that are really coming up with those and questioning research methodologies. Um, they don't work with, the, with what I'm trying to do. So I'm hoping that we can start collecting those and have those up on our websites as well. We're also really um, working hard at the beginning of every meeting now we do a fame and a shame thing to talk about well, what good things have happened on your campus that are supportive to our community you know what things were not so good um, and what are you working on so that we can all support each other and send each other to resources I think that having uh, the queer caucus is important uh, well, I would say generally, I think it's good to have the special interest groups uh, so that people of the same like mind, as well as the same, have the same interest, can have both the time and space during the conference uh, to address issues that, specific issues that uh, involve their group. I would say for the queer caucus specifically, I think it's important for GLBTQ members of the caucus to have both a uh, group of colleagues that they can share their ideas with, specifically for those people who work at institutions and may live in regions of the nation who are not supportive of GLBTQ communities. I don't have a lot of history of the Queer Caucus. We've been collecting archival um, evidence. We have been interviewing past caucus leaders um, and trying to slowly put together. So I'm hoping that Mark McBeth and I will be writing a chapter so that we'll have that. One of the biggest issues in the queer community is that we don't have a history that is easy to find. Of course, you don't get taught the history in your family because, you know, your parents are normally straight and so they don't have it. And then um, by the time you come out there's so many other issues and there's really hard to find places to collect that history. And in fact locally where I live we are just starting to do oral interviews and um, oral histories and collect the history in Central Florida of the gay community. So hopefully we can kind of push outward with that and have more more of that information for students and, and teachers. As far as I understand, the Queer Caucus, which was not then called the Queer Caucus, began in the 1970s. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to read a list of the names of, of 
the previous Queer Caucus. It was originally called the Committee on Lesbian and Gay Male Concerns in the English Profession. That was in 19, 19, 1972. In 1976, it was changed to Lesbian and Gay Male Caucus. Then in 1992, it turned it changed to Lesbian Gay Professional Caucus, and then in 2000 it was renamed Queer Caucus as it is currently uh, titled. Uh, I think the, the naming of the Queer Caucus and its kind of evolution uh, really kind of paralleled how the GLBD community developed uh, and, is, and, uh, and then the eventual uh, change an interest to actual queer theory itself. Uh, Louis Crew was one of the originating members and in fact in 1972 he and Norton Richter put together a special edition of College English uh, in which they did a uh, exclusively GLBTQ uh, themed edition um, on I think it was called On the Homosexual Imagination. Um, after that, uh, there were other leaders who I think took uh, extraordinary uh, measures to keep the, the Queer Caucus alive, uh, namely Paul Puccio and Harriet Milinowitz, who both in their ways, I think during the 80s, uh, they kept the, the group really energized. Um, and I think since then, uh, aside from a small period in the late 80s uh, when the group kind of uh, dissipated uh, and then it was brought back together. Um, it has been uh, really going strong. As far as I know, there has not been a queer member of C's who has chaired a conference um, or been in one of the higher executive positions. Now, someone may have and just not have been out, um, which is a possibility, so I hate to say no one ever has. But we are talking about this a lot. Um, we have a couple people in mind that we are trying to push to run for leadership roles. There will be people this year that will be on the ballot that um, we're hoping them to get into leadership positions so that eventually they, you know, in a few years can um, be in a position to chair the conference. Um, and I'm hoping then that we can really make the conference look a little different than it does. The relationship between the Queer Caucus and the overall organizations of, of NCTE and 4Cs, uh, I mean, in my experience, the overall organization has been uh, fairly responsive to the, the needs of the group. After the... Uh, after the San Francisco Sense of the House motions that the Queer Caucus put before the Executive Committee, uh, they immediately put a committee on LGBTQ issues in place uh, to actually, uh, through research, find out uh, how the organization can help. Uh, I think that, and I know that with NCTE, I know there's a group of both uh, predominantly high school teachers that also have a group and I know that NCT addresses their issues as well. Um, again, I think that probably any special interest group uh, may feel that they need more attention um, from the overall organization, but I think again this is oftentimes a limitation of uh, the time that we have actually to do those things. I'm, co I'm the um, co-director of the um, LGBTQ task force that foresees um, two years ago we had a sense of the house motion and we asked the C's to put together a task force and Charles Brazerman did it right away like the next day it was wonderful um, so far and it was um, Jackie Rhodes and Jonathan Alexander were put in charge of it and they did a survey and created a website and a few other things, but they both are very involved on their campuses, and so they asked Mark Macbeth and I if we would take over, and we agreed to do that. So now we're finishing up with the um, task the task force was given, and we actually, I found out today, we're actually a committee, because the task force only runs for one year, but these are things you learn as you go.